as I go through um, our uh, major You know, everybody who works in a school environment, and she was blown away. She had no idea the number of people we had trained, the number of courses we had offered, and the amount of training that we were doing. The problem that we had was we got to the point where it was difficult to get into a school environment and train because we had more and more schools that had summer school. You had schools that were getting uh, capital improvement money that were doing renovations in the summertime, doing upfits, re remodeling. And we really need to train officers in an environment that, that that looks like a school. And we couldn't recreate that. We couldn't recreate that at the academy. We can't recreate it at SLED. We can't recreate it when we offer a course at some auditorium or, or something such as that. And so it was really important for us to, to find a place that we could do it. Uh, get the Lexington District 1 had allowed us to train there for about the last five years. And that school had been closed. It was a school that was built in the 1950s, as you know, the initial part of it been built on to over the years but um and so we came up with the idea i went to the lexington delegation um, spoke to all of them they were 100 percent supportive the governor's office the leadership of the house and senate was 100 percent uh, supportive um i would say it was a, the only time that i ever got every penny i asked for I in my budget request, but if I did, I'd be lying because my first budget request as chief of sled, I got everything I asked for as well um, back, I guess, in 2012. But the bottom line, we got funded. We, we told them that the time that we knew we would need more funding for this project, that we didn't have enough, but we knew we had enough to get started. Um, we have since hired um, an architect to come in and do an assessment. As you can imagine, the mechanical in the school is all into life, um, the heat and the air and, and that type thing. Um, we have some mold issues because the school was closed up for a long time and there's issues we've got to mitigate with, with mold. Um, we have enough money in our budget and we have a project that's at the Department of Administration right now to spend about one and a half million dollars to start this project so that we can actually get our office area uh, completed and what we call the shoot house, the two-story part of this building where we're, off, we're using it now. But we wanna get our offices out there so we got people there on site. And we wanna be offering training every week. And we wanna be offering it free to every law enforcement agency, every school district in the state of South Carolina. We wanna be, be able to provide any sort of training that they need. We also asked for in our budget, and, 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 and y'all were gracious to give it to us, is that we also asked for two behavioral scientists, two additional behavioral scientists, because one of the things that superintendents continued to talk to me about was, Chief, we need help with that troubled child that has not crossed the line yet to do something criminal. We know who they are, but we need help with that child. And so we want to work with our behavioral science folks, with our mental health folks, our social workers, our school uh, administrators, our law enforcement, to try and provide help for those individuals as well. And if they're on the wrong track, try to get them back on the right track so that, um, again, God forbid, we don't have uh, something terrible happen that we've seen happen all across our country. Um, we never know, uh, we never know what's gonna happen, but I would tell you that I think our officers are very prepared for it, the way we train um, and I was, uh, need to say, I was, uh, I couldn't believe what happened in, in, in Texas. Um, I, I'm, I'm willing to bet money that would never happen in South Carolina, that we would stand by for hours and respond. But I would hope we're not training for that. Well, I hope we're not either, but, yeah. but we have to, unfortunately, in the environment, the world we live in, we have well, to train. And I hope, I hope the training is not that we stand around and wait. It's not. <laughs> it absolutely is not. It is, is the training is, and the training, the same training those folks had was whether it was one officer that got there or two officers, they respond. Yeah. They go to the shoot. And that's exactly what we train today. All right. Um, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Senator, yeah, Senator Warnerberg. Thank you. Um, so, Chief, I want to go through a couple um, areas with you. First of all, just out of curiosity, when you were the president of the National Association, you said 49 out of 50. What, what state doesn't have a police? Hawaii does not have. So Hawaii 5-0, I always say, is a myth. Um, 
Uh, <laughs> Hawaii does not have a state police. They are they are in the process right now, Senator. They are in the process and are, are making strides to have a state bureau investigation, but they're just not quite there yet. But they're they're on the way, and we hope that they'll be, be a member of our association very soon. Okay, well that's cool. Um, so uh, you mentioned that you uh, have uh, agents actually out in the rural areas, and I know even even towns and municipal I mean towns and counties that have uh, agencies. If it's an arson or something specialized, you always send your agents in. And we, I, I know they appreciate that. But we got I just take Orangeburg for example. Probably half the towns have a police chief and maybe an officer, and and then the other half don't have don't. And so the sheriff's department covers those. Right. And then in, you mentioned Allendale. I mean, really, there's Fairfax and Allendale and then the county. And it just seems to me that uh, the people, no matter where they live, whether they live in town or in the county, deserve the same quality of law enforcement as if they lived in Somerville or Charleston. That's right. Is, is there a way, uh, is there, would it be uh, a, a, a successful law enforcement strategy to have countywide law enforcement or even to have SLED partner with counties so that you're ingrained in all those departments? Because, as you know, and, and the, we heard the issue with the Highway Patrol, to try and recruit somebody to come in law enforcement these days, you got to, you know, it, particularly at that level, assistant city police officer, they're not paying – Fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Twenty-eight thousand dollars is what they were paying when we went to Allen. Right. So, is it feasible for these small counties to continue to have uh, two police chiefs and a sheriff and and ten officers in the county, uh, or, or should we look at having more countywide or even regionwide policing? Senator, I, I think this. You know, when I I quoted that number, one hundred fifty-six agencies, less than ten person departments. Um, or 10, 10 or less person departments. And that number grew from about 2020, it was 118. It grew to 156. And as you can correlation there between what was going on in law enforcement during this period of time and the fact that we have more vacancies in law enforcement. Um, do I think that there are some agencies that probably should not be agencies? And if a city or town with a one or two person department uh, should not provide whatever funding they have a law enforcement agency and provide it to the county, I absolutely do. I think it makes sense. I think it would be um, I, I think it I think it would be beneficial to to that jurisdiction to be able to do that. Well we ha we have school districts that don't perform and so we send the State Department in basically to uh, to, to make sure that the students in those areas Sir. can receive a quality education even if the local um, School is just the test scores will show they're not performing. Do y'all do assessments on individual police departments to determine that, that they're up to snuff, so to speak? No, so we don't do any assessments. I mean, we really we don't have any authority to do any assessments uh, of such uh, like that. But but no, sir, we we don't do any assessments. I mean, again, as you know, um, the way we ended up in Allendale for I don't know it was over a year that we spent time there in Allendale working shifts. Was a, I simply got a call from the sheriff, and he said, Chief, he said, I got I got 11 positions for deputies. He said, I only got six deputies. And I got five. And he said, the chief of police in Allendale is retired. He, chief Sullivan has been there 40 years. And he's retiring. He's got one officer that's going to leave when he leaves and got one more. Y'all investigate. And he said, I, I need help. And, um, and so we sent folks down to sit down and meet with him. And talked to him. And Allendale at the time was the only county, and I don't know where they do today, but they were the only county that didn't have 24-hour law enforcement service. Um, they didn't have anybody that worked 24 hours. And, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate y'all's willingness to step in and do that. I, I guess what I'm asking is, should we look at a more systematic review of law enforcement across this state to determine whether citizens in particular areas have adequate law enforcement or not? Because just because the a town says they want to hire a police chief, uh, and, and obviously those persons have to go through the same criminal justice academy and all, but having a chief and one officer in a town is pretty hard to provide 24-hour support with just two yeah. people. Senator, I think this, and I, and I think I know 
Chief Stewart sitting back here behind me. And if I remember correctly, some years ago, there was uh, some talk about setting some minimum requirements to be a police department. And um, and I don't think that really ever got off the ground, but I know that there was talk about that. There was talk among apparently the General Assembly about that at the time, about creating those minimum standards that you had to have so many people. You had to have so 24-hour service. You know, you had to have a dispatch you, and those type things. And and do I think that that's something that ought to be done? Yes, I do. Um, again, as I tell you, that's what we try to do. We try to fill that gap. You know, we try to make sure that the citizen of Allendale gets the same law enforcement service that, that we did. And I'll tell you that our folks, um, although we're not, um, you know, jumping up and down about uh, that assignment, when they got that assignment, I can tell you that after they had been there a short time, the citizens in Allendale, uh, you know, when they would talk to them and they'd say, hey, we can come sit on my front porch now at night and don't have to hear gunfire. We're not awakened at night by gunfire. It made our folks uh, really understand how much a small town appreciates good law enforcement. And so, uh, I'm one of those people that absolutely, I think every citizen in this state deserves an equal level. And and, and we, we know that that's not, we know that doesn't happen across our state. Um, I can't make agencies call me. I talk to chiefs and sheriffs every meeting I go to, and I tell them all the time, you know, all you got to do is pick the phone up and call. You never get the bill from SLED. We're going to respond to you. We're going to provide you every resource we got. And and I think every chief in, in, in the state knows that. Every chief and sheriff knows that. So uh, one area where you often get a call, if not, maybe it's mandatory, when there's an officer, the officer involved shooting, are y'all yes. the primary agency to investigate the sheriffs and the cities for that? We are. Like I said, there's only one jurisdiction that does not call us for officer involved shootings. And, and, okay. Uh, that's it. Um, all right, I'm going to switch uh, switch topics to this. Uh, a couple of years ago, we um, passed legislation regarding sexual assault uh, tracking kits because the uh, report was that there were maybe even thousands backlogged. And I know y'all recently got a new lab, and I know you're uh, by statute supposed to put out annual reports. Uh, do you have the data to show where you are in the processing of the sexual assault uh, kit and 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 uh, what the plan is to bring that up to date? Senator, we, we are. I can tell you that, um, and I'd like to give, give you some figures just about the new lab that um, I thought that question might come up with regards to the new lab and, and what we've seen as far as the production and, and the benefit of the new lab. The sexual assault kit tracking bill, as you know, were, was passed um, in um, December the 11th. Uh, we started the first uh, in the PD region. We, we're broken up in four regions of South Carolina, the PD, Low Country, Midlands, and Piedmont. We went live with that sexual assault kit tracking system in the PD region first. That was December the 11th. And, and, but, and that means a victim can go online and see where they're... That's being. exactly right. Okay. And it tracks it from from the hospital, from where the kit's taken at. They can go online and they can see where it's at in the whole process. And they can continue to updated. They're provided uh, when the kid is taken, they're provided a username and temporary password. And, and what can, is the uh, timetable, the backlog right now? The backlog on sexual assault kits? Mm -hmm. um, Senator, it's, let me answer it this way. Do we have a backlog? Yes. Are we working that backlog? We're working it as hard as we can. The one thing that we focus on is we focus on uh, sexual assaults on minors and we focus on those unknown uh, assailants. Because obviously, you know, we have a lot of sexual assaults where we know who the assailant is. We have a sexual assault kit. That sexual assault kit is not necessarily gonna tell us where it's consensual or not. It will tell us, you know, whether there was assault. And so we focus on minors and we focus on unknown suspects. It's the kits we focus on. We do have a backlog there. That backlog is, uh, is is getting better. It's getting better because, again, General Assembly, uh, we've hired eight new DNA analysts. Um, I think all but four of those DNA analysts, take that back, yeah, all but four of those DNA analysts now are working on the bench. 
it takes about a year and a half to two years to train them to where they can uh, do a, uh, work DNA cases and be able to testify in court. So we're going to continue to see those numbers drop. Since February the 20th, all counties are now in the sexual assault kit tracking program. Uh, we've so far 215 uh, sexual assault kits have been entered into that program. We still have some agencies that um, that have not. Uh, we still have some hospitals uh, where the kits are taken generally that uh, are not submitting the information to us. They end up submitting it to a law enforcement agency. The law enforcement agency ends up bringing the sled lab. We take it. But what we do is, and we go back and we research where the hospital, what hospital took it. We put that, we fill in that information in the system so that the survivor can go back and see exactly the process and the timeline on that on that kit. Um, the other thing I would tell you again, and I just want to give you some, I'm not trying to change the subject on, on the sexual assault kit, but I want to give you some information with regards to uh, what the new lab has done as far as reducing backlogs. So trace evidence. We've had a reduction of 700, uh, 1,731 assignments in October 21 to 300 assignments in March of 20. 24, that's an 83% reduction in trace firearms, reduction from 2,157 assignments in January of 23 to 1,690 assignments in March of 24, 22% reduction. DNA database, in July of 2022, there was a backlog of 1,335 arrestee samples and 614 convictor, convicted offender samples as of March 31st, 2024. Those numbers are down to four arresting samples and two convicted offender samples. So again, a 99% reduction. You can see it because of, of the new lab, because of the workflow that we have in the new lab, and because of additional forensic scientists that, that y'all have, have provided for us. The DNA database, again, July 22, the backlog on DNA expungements was 2,086. As of April the 1st, 2024, that number is down to five. Uh, drug analysis, we've had three consecutive months where we've had a reduction in our backlog. And again, uh, toxicology, you look from uh, numbers uh, as of March 23, uh, we only got 123 uh, case assignments. It's over 30 days in toxicology. We've only, in crime scene, we've only got 24 assignments older than 30 days. And in latent prints, only 107 assignments older than 30 days. So we've seen dramatic drops. DNA will be the last one that we start seeing. Hopefully, we'll start seeing dramatic drops when we get all of our DNA scientists on the bench and have them working cases. And do y'all have a process uh, such that if a solicitor calls up and said, I really need Absolutely. To, that y'all will prioritize that? We prioritize cases every week. Senator, I get calls from chiefs. I get calls from sheriffs. I get calls from judges sometimes that wants to call a case. And, um, and I will tell you, I'll tell you, I, I say this because oftentimes we get the blame for, for it, but sometimes uh, they'll call me about a case and the case will not even be have been submitted to us yet. But yet we're to blame for, for not, you know, having it done. Does that mean that they've got the evidence just sitting in their locker rooms at the local agency and they have not submitted it? That's exactly what it means. Okay. And we have that happen sometimes, but we prioritize cases every week. We get calls and all kinds of cases from DNA to trace to you know, toxicology may have a coroner to call me and they have a tox case that they really want to get, get out and, and we prioritize those cases. Is your is your lab, the new lab, fully stocked and fully um, has all the the machines that it needs? We do. Uh, we we are uh, we have a couple of requests in from new new machines, additional machines. The the reason we were able to do what we did with the backlog of arrestee and convicted offender samples was because we had the additional equipment to be able to set these uh, systems up to where we run them at night, all night. They, they put the information, put the samples on the system. They run at night. They come in, take the results off in the morning. But the reason we were able to do that is because of the equipment rooms we have, the amount of equipment that we have in our laboratory today, and it makes all the difference in the world. And, this equipment is not easy. I mean, we've got some uh, equipment rooms that have literally tens of millions of dollars worth of equipment uh, in those because these machines are 
from $180,000 to $450,000 a piece. All right. All right. I want to switch to, to yet another topic, which is kind of an old one, but I never got an answer to it. But I figure maybe I'll get an answer today. Um, so back uh, in the Haley administration, there was a data breach. And yes. somebody hacked into the system and, and stole or allegedly stole the personal information of, of South Carolina taxpayers or, or other things. And uh, allegedly, we paid the hacker off and, and nothing ever came of it. And people, uh, the state paid like $50 million to buy everybody this coverage to monitor their systems. And, of course, nobody uh, it ever um, – could show that anything from the hack ever actually hurt anybody's credit. What, what really happened there? I really had hoped you'd forgot about that. No. What no I, you always told me it was on the active investigation. And I figure after 14 years, either well, you're doing a poor job of investigating, <laughs> if you ain't caught them in 14 years, or the investigation's off, and now you can tell us that y'all paid somebody in Azerbaijan $28,000 or whatever it was, and so I want to know in full transparency what happened. I just think that, the, you know, we we were led to believe that, the, and, and look, I don't fault, if that's what we did, I don't fault you at all. That's I mean, that happens all the time. I'm not complaining about it. I just think that w when we spent those millions of dollars to try and make sure that our citizens were protected, if we knew all along that we had successfully terminated the 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 potential harm, why would we ask to do that? And and I know you at the time, and look, look, well, first of all, it wasn't you. I mean, you were the the Haley administration. And I'm not trying to blame her either because I don't blame anybody. I think y'all did the right thing. I just want to know what you did. Well, so I'm, you I'm, did probably, right I'm probably so still not going to be. <laughs> I, 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 well, obviously, I'm, I mean, no nobody's data got. I, I'm probably still not going to be totally transparent with you, okay? <laughs> but I'm not gonna lie to you either, okay? okay. So I, I just I just say this. I, I think the fact that, and you've already said it. I think the fact that um, that we didn't come up with a whole lot of people's information that got breached, I think, is a testament to the work that was done on this case. I think that the uh, insurance that was purchased, I believe, was necessary because. Um, when this thing first happened, when it initially happened, uh, we didn't know what the outcome of that information was going to be. Uh, we didn't know who may have it. Uh, we didn't know how it would be sold or, or be utilized. You know, today we see these breaches and, and they sell this information on the dark web to the highest bidder, and it ends up being utilized. And so I think that the decision that was made initially when it happened is we first the first thing that we got to protect our citizens. So we've got to we've got to go to an extent that maybe hopefully we didn't need to, but we got to go to an extent to make sure that we try and protect our citizens and protect their information. And that's what was done initially, and that was a decision that was made. It was a decision that was made by um, the experts in the field, Mandia, who you know the state also engaged it well. And I can remember, I remember very clearly a, a conversation that we had in the conference room at the governor's office that um, Governor Haley uh, stated to the folks at Mandia. She said, I want to make sure that this never happens again. I want to be able to tell the citizens of South Carolina this will never happen again. And I remember the Mandia folks saying, no, you don't ever want to say that. <laughs> because as soon as you say that, they're going to target South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So I would just say that, again, um, I would have to leave it at, at the fact that um, we do believe we protected the information in, in the best way we could, um, and I think it's it's as a result of what we've not seen, and and I think that the insurance that was purchased by the state and the amount of money that was spent by the state, it was one of those things that we didn't really have a choice. I mean, it was something that we had to do because at the time this happened, we had to start trying to protect people immediately. And we didn't have time for the investigation to play out the way it ultimately played out, and we just had to we had to protect our citizens. Did it play out? Do you know who did it? Uh, yes, sir. I know who did it. Yes. Have been prosecuted? Um, we didn't have to because we paid them off. If we could, uh, 
if we could ever get to this individual, okay, they may be. All right. Um, well, look, let me just uh, close on this. I, you, you know, I, a couple times I've had to call you, um, somebody, a sniper, shot through my secretary's window going to a ball game, came within inches of killing her child, right. and you had agents on the ground within minutes and found the sniper's nest, uh, arrested those kids, or, you know, got those uh, kids in the family court. And I had another instance where uh, my staff was threatened. Uh, police surrounded our law office. You had agents there, and I think y'all actually found the person who made the call within 30 minutes. And so, I mean, clearly you know what you're doing, or your staff, you know, and I, I attribute that to you. Y'all do a good job at, at the, the, the blocking and tackling of, of law enforcement and taking calls and handling them and, and getting them done. And I, I know I, I'll, I, um, we only a, a, a month and a day apart because I saw your birthday was July 5th, mine's August 6th. So, uh, I know that uh, you grew up in the rural area like I did, and when we went to the groundbreaking at Barnwell, fire department they told the story of how at 16 years old you were there volunteering at fire department so i know this has been in your in your blood but what and, and you said you you wanted this job what's the biggest challenge you face now is, is it is it personnel is it resources or something like technology or the the new drugs that are coming on the market or is it gangs i mean i don't know what 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 are you, what are the serious things you're facing so the first thing I want to tell you that uh, I am blessed. Um, I am blessed with the employees that we have at SLED. Um, I say this, and I, I don't say this as a discredit to any other state agency or any other state employees, but obviously I think my employees are the best. Um, I see our agents and our non-sworn employees both uh, they sacrifice their their time. They sacrifice, unfortunately, sometimes they sacrifice their families. Um, they sacrifice financially. They sacrifice their health um, because of this job. They they truly are dedicated public servants. And so, um, I just want to say that because it's not it's not. It's not my employees. I mean, obviously, we want y'all to continue to provide us the resources to retain. We hire very qualified people. And, and you know, some of my chiefs and sheriffs, um, some of them sitting behind me, um, sometimes I'm sure grown when we hire, you know, one of their best people. But they understand that, I think they understand they're going to get that person back and more, you know, in, in service from SLED. I think the diff, most difficult thing uh, for us is trying to keep up with technology. I mean, the whole drug thing right now, the proliferation of drugs that we've seen that are killing people is is something. And, you know, I started out my career in, in, in Orangeburg you know, working drugs. And my first three and a half years at SLED working narcotics undercover, buying drugs. Uh, I, I've never seen the proliferation of drugs that we're seeing today, and it, it and worries the me. Potent, the potency, the potency, it. absolutely. And you know, and and the and the and the the relative inexpensive cost compared to what it was in the past. And we've seen other states. You know, I just saw, I think it was Oregon that just went back and recriminalized possession of drugs because they just saw, we're just killing people right and left. And so, um. But I think technology is probably the most difficult thing. It's difficult for us as state agency uh, heads to hire IT personnel that we need to hire and be able to retain because the commercial sector, the private sector is paying two, three times what we're paying. I know the Department of Administration, I understand, is doing a study right now about all IT positions and looking at, you know, I guess increasing the pay band, reclassifying. But I think that and just trying to keep up with technology, not falling behind. Um, because it's so easy to fall behind today because it changes so quickly. And and everything we do, there's no investigation we do today that's not involving a computer or a cell phone or, you know, iPad or, or, or something, whether it's a murder investigation or, or human trafficking investigation or whatever it may be. And so technology is a is a 
is a difficult thing, and especially it's difficult for somebody like me, <laughs> you know, because I'm not a I'm not a technology wizard, you know, and I'm just thank God I got some really qualified people get slid uh, in my cyber unit. Um, that's a that's a unit that I think that the state uh, really depends on. Our economy depends on, uh, you know, providing protection for our small business, not only our large business, but our small business as well. And the SC Kick program that that uh, that we're running at Sled is doing a tremendous job for the small amount of personnel they have and technology that they have, and we could do so much more. It was in my budget request this year, and I, I'll throw it in. I actually went and saw Senator Peeler about it specifically because it's something that's so important to our state and the economy of our state um, with the foreign actors that we have that's every day trying to, you know, trying to take our information and, and trying to shut our businesses down with ransomware. And so it's something that we we really need to invest in. And, um, and the investment I asked for was not a huge investment, but it was an investment that I think would make, it would pay huge dividends. Where are you on your staffing now? You know, we always have some uh, positions uh, that are open. We, we don't have a lot of agent positions. Um, most of our agents, if they leave, they're retiring, uh, retiring for good. Or either we have we lose a few to federal agencies occasionally. Um, don't lose that many. I just I'm in the process of hiring three FBI agents that, that are FBI agents now. That uh, two of them are active agents. It's, they're already on board. I got a third one that's coming. Um, just coming back to South Carolina, coming back home. Um, but we lose some agents to that end up going as a captain over investigations in an agency or go to assistant chief position and that type thing. We probably got 12 agent positions open right now. Um, I think our last payroll, we had 790 employees. Um, the majority of the positions that we have open right now are temporary positions. Um, we have... Unfortunately, we hire, we have a lot of temporary positions because, and, and I'll say this, and I'm, please don't take offense to this, but we get responsibilities put on us and we don't get, we don't, we do a fiscal impact statement, but sometimes the financing don't come through with the fiscal impact statement. And so we end up having to hire temporary employees to, to do those jobs. And just like the, the bond uh, bill last year, um, doing the certifications of the businesses and the, the, uh, the devices, um, we just have to put on another hat, you know, and we, we try to hire somebody temporary if we can to come in. And so we have a lot of turnover in those temporary positions. And that's unfortunate because we spend time training them to do a job. And then as soon as the FTP, FTE position opens in state government, generally anywhere, but a lot of times in state law enforcement agencies, of course, they go up and leave. And, and I understand that. And I support them in trying to, trying to get that FTE position. So didn't we? I think we just put on you the responsibility of putting on CWP classes all over the state. Well, and I'm told I'm gonna get funding for that. I, I hope and pray we do. I mean, you know, and and you know, to, and 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 it, and it worries me a little bit. You because, don't let me know because the day to you know the day the bill passes, we're supposed to be doing it. Oh, right. And 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 that's and you know that's another thing. If I, uh, I guess since I'm confessing here now, I, I'll just say this. I I, I wish that when 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 the General Assembly assigned us something to do, that they would talk to us about uh, a date that it would actually go live. And we have done that in some cases. In some cases, we'd say, well, it doesn't go live until the funding's appropriated. You know, and, and sometimes it's not always funding, but sometimes it is some things that we need to do. And just like the sexual assault kit tracking, you know, we have to depend on vendors to, to help us do that. We we don't we don't have the programmers that sit down and program and write a program to be able to do that fits our statute. And then when you get a vendor, a vendor has an out of the box solution, but yet it has to be it has to be amended and changed to meet our statute, to meet our code, which is different from you know other states' code. And so none of these things happen quickly. And and that would be something that again I, I would you know I would welcome you know General Assembly at least looking at. And, and talking to us about when we get assigned to one of those things is, you know, what's a real effective date that we can put it in place? Thank you. Thanks, Senator.
And I'm going to say this too. You know, you and I hadn't always agreed on everything, but again, uh, you've always been. Uh, I think you know that I don't care who calls me, and I don't care whether I agree or disagree with them. I'm going to do everything I can to provide the assistance that Sled uh, provides. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Senator Hutto and I've kind of dominated the questions here. Uh, Senator from Richland, do you have questions? Just a couple. I'll be very brief, um, Chief Keel, and thank you for being willing uh, to actually be reappointed. You've, you've served the state admirably for many years. Um, and, and to go back to that, let me start off with that, because you talked about always wanting this job. Um, and I, I feel very strongly that um, we don't um, emphasize a career in law enforcement and the impact that you can have. Um, so if you would kind of share with us what you know, this career and it's been a long time, um, what do you see as far as being able to, to emphasize this as a career option uh, for folks coming in that this can certainly be a very admirable career that you can serve your state in a way unlike any of us have? You know, I, I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of people now, and I, I, I go to Rotary Clubs and talk to people. I, I was teaching an executive management class at the academy yesterday when they were all police officers, uh, some detention officers and all. And every opportunity I get to talk to young people, I met with our intern yesterday uh, and, and sat and talked with them for about an hour and told them about my career and how I got started and why. And... Um, and what I try to tell people is everywhere I go, to, this this is an honorable profession. Um, you know, despite um, the negative things that's happened over the past few years, and there's been many. And and it's like I say, but that is not the the, the that is not the majority of officers. In every profession, we have bad people. You know, there's no profession that we don't have bad people. And unfortunately, we we've, we've got ours. And I. Uh, again, I thank the General Assembly for giving us a system that we have at the academy right now so that we can get those officers that um, that um, that need to be weeded out. We can get them out of our profession, and we can get them where they'll never law be a law enforcement officer in the state of South Carolina again, and I think that's important. And I think it shows that we police our own profession, that um, – and, and I think we do it in a way that is fair, but at the same time, uh, those that, um, you know, I have some standards set for my agency um, that are zero, um, you know, they, they, if, you, if you lie in my agency, you're fired. Just that simple. I can, I'm not going to have somebody who's dishonest in my agency. If you get caught for DUI, I'm sorry, you're gone. I don't care whether you get you know, what the charge, what, what the charge ends up being. I mean, I, I believe in that. I, I was DPS director for three years. The year before I went there, we had a thousand seventy seven fatalities. Half of those fatalities were caused by drunk drivers, many of them innocent people. And, um, as important as I knew it was then, I made my mind up that, um, uh, from that before that that was going to be, you know, I was going to zero tolerance for it. Um, Unnecessary use of force, zero tolerance. Uh, using a racial epithet, zero tolerance. And I think that what I try to impress upon young people is is the difference that they can make. And I told that group yesterday of interns, what they can give back to their community is is why I do what I do. When I get to the point, you know. The, the one thing I can say is that the reason I started in public service is because I wanted to make a difference and I wanted to help my community, and that has never changed. You know, um, and that's simple to say, but that's why I got into public service is because I wanted to make a difference in the little community that I lived in, and um, and so um, that hadn't changed with me. And I try to impress upon young people again what an honorable profession it can be. If you want to make a million dollars, this is not the profession for you. You know, you're not going to get rich doing it. But you can make an honest living doing it. And yes, depending on where you work, you may have to work a second job. You know, um, you know, 
I probably shouldn't say this. I'm going to say it anyway. So my wife's been in the cleaning business for 33 years, okay? Um, when her and I first met, uh, to be able to own what we got today, I was going out at night and cleaning houses with her. And that's what I did. And I did that as a supervisor at SLED. And I wasn't ashamed of it because I worked hard all my life. I mean, that's that's all, all I knew. I had a dad with an eighth grade education, and from the time he was 13 years old, he was a, he was a, the head of the family because his father died at 51, and and his brothers were in World War II, and I was brought up. I was brought up working hard, seeing my dad work hard, three jobs to make ends meet for our family, and to um, and serve the community, and that's what he did. And he served on city council. He was on the Lowe's Atlanta Regional Plan and Development Board. He was chair. He ended up being chair of the hospital board in Marmel. I mean, he was he was all about community. And and so again, I was thankful that I, I had two uncles that did it, and I knew what I wanted to do. And and I just encourage young people to there. There's no set. There's no more satisfaction that you can get in a in a career than having citizens come up to you and tell you how much they appreciate what you're doing. Okay. And that happens routinely. Everywhere I go, I have people come up to me and tell me how much they appreciate SLED. And, and I always tell them, it's not me. It's not me. It's the people that work for me. It's the people that are sitting behind me back here today, many of them, that are that are doing the hard work. I just try, try my best as a leader of an agency to try to provide them the resources they need, the tools they need to try to do the job for the citizens of our state and to try to do it equally, no matter, again, race, gender, socioeconomic status. I don't care where you're from, big county, small county, wherever it is. Um, to me, that's what it's all about. Thank you. And and I've observed that, um, and you've pretty much mentioned it there, but do you know what the diversity, um, uh, race, gender, um, and slip? I do. I want to tell you, so I, I, I brought this. It might be a question I might get asked as well. So I just want to tell you, so based on our 24 annual report, it's um, to the General Assembly prepared by Human Affairs Commission. We showed an increase in our achievement of firm, affirmative action goals. The benchmark for SHAC, as you may know or may not, is 70% of the goals. We try to meet 70% of the goals. Uh, our goal attainment for 2023 was 80.7%, and that was a 4.5% increase from the previous year. We met our established goals for minorities in the executive level command staff. We met it in our law enforcement supervisors, which is our senior agents, lieutenants, captains, and majors. We met it in our technicians, our IT personnel, and our forensic techs. And we also met it in our paraprofessionals, which is our legis and accounting personnel. We also met our established goals um, for females in non-supervisory law enforcement positions. That's our special agent, our income and special agent position. Though we did not meet it in African-American males or minority males in the non-supervisory position, we did increase that 15.2% in last year's um, last year's achievement. So again, uh, we continue every day to recruit and, and uh, hire and promote uh, minorities. Um, and, and that's a difficult job as well, because again, it's, it's like, it's, it's difficult to recruit people into this profession, but we, uh, we, we do our very best to do that. And we're proud of the goals that we attain and we, we, we're not going to rest it. Okay, we've met, you know, so we've got above 70%. We're all right. We want to continue to improve on that. Thank you. Let me shift to, um, we talked about the concealed weapons permit. Um, two two issues with that. Number one, and you mentioned the training. Um, and um, I've had questions from folks. The, the way the bill is written, um, there's a lot of, current providers, we don't want to put them out of business that, that you will right. would contract with them. Have you thought through and do you have a process on how are you going to 
uh, get the providers and what what assurances do we have that that will be diversity in, in we, we providers? Are, we certainly want to do that. And what we want to do is we want to uh, we, we're going to obviously uh, ask for those that want that want to participate in the program. Not everyone will want to do it, but we'll we'll uh, we'll put the word out when the time is appropriate to those that uh, our CW our current CWP instructors. And we'll put the word out, and we'll uh, uh, we'll ask for those that are interested in the program, and then we'll evaluate their their uh, classes, their uh, lesson plans that they currently have, mm -hmm. and uh, and then we'll make selections to to see that it is a diverse population that that are providing that training to to those that wish to get it. Mm -hmm. And and Chief, you mentioned, and I agree with you that. When they're when y'all are directed to do something, you should definitely be at the table. Um, are there any other challenges that you believe that you have um, that, based on legislation this general assembly has passed, that has made it more difficult for you? And, and what do we need to know to make it easier? I, I just think it's you know again I I, I, I certainly I, please don't take any of this as criticism. Um, I just want to say this is that um, we don't. I, I went back and I went back and uh, I actually, yeah, you know, I did a lot of preparation for this, this hearing, but I went back and I looked at the bills that have been passed since 2020. And all those bills that's been passed since 2020 are bills that impacted SLED in some way. The ones in yellow are the ones that were funded. The ones in white are the ones that were not highlighted, or the ones that were not funded. And and some of those, some of those didn't need funding, to be honest. But but the bottom line is, I mean, the only thing I wish is that again, we we I think that we continue to get responsibilities put on us because we do we do the job. At least that's what I'm told. When I'm told by members of General Assembly Chief, we ask y'all to do something. We know y'all gonna do it. And we're going to do the very best we can at it, but it it does really impact us sometimes when we when a bill passes and it's in effect today, and we're not prepared to be able to do it, or we don't have the personnel resources to be able to do what we need to do, and and we end up having to um, we end up having to take somebody from another job or take somebody off of, of another job that is also a responsibility that we have. To be able to try and do this, like taking people out of CWP program and putting them into a program where we're trying to uh, certify devices for uh, electronic monitoring or certified electronic monitoring companies. So far, we've certified seven electronic devices and seven companies, and we've got eight companies under review right now. Again, those are people that had full time jobs at SLED that are now being taken off of those jobs and being trying to do something else and so that does impact that does Im impact us and it impacts us as an agency and and um and so i mean when it comes to the legislation it, it would be helpful obviously i mean we we put a lot of time and try to try to do what's right about doing fiscal impact statements and, and making them realistic not just trying to you know uh, add on or pile on we try to try to do that and it's it would it's important to us that when we when we get those responsibilities, that we get the resources that we need to carry out those responsibilities. And then my, my last question, Chief, is you, you mentioned that we have some very small agencies. We've got some larger agencies um, and that you support no matter the size. But I will tell you that one thing that currently I see, um, and I believe it's statewide, but certainly in the district that I represent, um, is the rise in gun violence, particularly with our young people. Um, and I just wanted to know what role do you believe that SLED plays in supporting, you know, my chief is here, he does an amazing job with very little resources, but um, you know, this a lot. Um, so what role do you believe SLED um, plays in helping us address that statewide? Senator, he, he, he does do a wonderful job here. And, and I can tell you that we try to provide the city of Columbia, um, when I first met him, the first time uh, the city administrator brought him out sled and, and I met him and I actually assembled all the other police chiefs in the area and sheriffs to, to meet uh, Chief Holbrook. And, uh, and I think he would tell you if he was to sit up here today, 
that there is nothing that city of Columbia asked for that we do not provide him. Um, and we try to do that for every single jurisdiction in the state of South Carolina. Gun violence, again, doesn't just affect your district, obviously affects many districts in the state. We provide uh, agents, and not only agents, but highway patrolmen, Triple P, uh, DNR officers to come and work crime suppression, what we talk about crime suppression in those areas where we have maybe open drug dealing on the street, we have uh, drive-by shootings, retaliatory type shootings. We send agents and officers from state, uh, state agencies to go into those communities and to saturate those communities, and, and, and especially we'll try to do it on times and dates where they have the most activity, and we'll saturate those communities. We'll send the aircraft there as well. We've been working with, with uh, Chief Holbert in the city of Columbia, where we've been doing patrols over the city of Columbia, uh, responding to his shot spotter calls and his real-time crime center is just doing amazing, amazing things with the city of Columbia and being able to respond and be on the scene before somebody can leave the scene, we can have an aircraft on that on that scene, and we're trying to do that. We're going to expand that to other communities in our state as well. And then the other thing that our lab is doing uh, with our with our uh, our IBIS program or our uh, NIBIN, uh, the Integrated Ballistic Identification System, where we're taking and we're encouraging every agency if they seize a weapon or if they have a drive-by shooting to collect those shell casings and bring those to SLED and let us enter them in this national system that has or is able to correlate if that shell, if that gun was fired at another drive-by shooting, if that shell casing comes back and there's a comparison, one was shot in Lexington and one was shot in, in Richland, and being able to put those two agencies together and say, hey, we don't know who it was, but we know this was the same gun that shot these two shell casings. And so we, we try to do everything we can to, to, um, to communicate and collaborate with agencies and, and provide them whatever assistance they ask for. And then, again, when I hear bad things happening, I call the sheriff or chief up, and I said, hey, I'll make suggestions to them. I said, yeah, maybe if you're having problems on Friday and Saturday nights or Sunday nights, how about let's, let's look at doing some crime suppression. Let's look at saturating the area with highway patrol, SLED, DNR, Triple P, and go up there with an effort. And also, let's let's look at you, who you, who's your most violent offenders. Who are those that's out on probation, uh, parole, that, that, that you know are out uh, pulling the trigger? And let's look at them. Let's see what we can do and, 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 and focus on them. And, you know, with probation, parole, they can make home visits. Go by and check on them and see what they're doing. And so we as a group, it's not just SLED, but we as state law enforcement are trying to help our communities uh, that have having these problems and these retaliatory shootings uh, that we've had and drive-bys. We do everything we can to communicate with those agencies and, and offer the assistance that we can provide them. And, and we try to do that on a regular basis. Berlin, do you have any questions? Good morning, Chief. How are morning. you? I'm good, sir. I didn't realize sitting here listening to you a little bit earlier, you said you started a fire, went to EMS, and went into police. But I actually did the exact same thing. Fire, EMS, went into police. I just got a little dumber. I retired and went into politics. <laughs> I, I won't comment on that. <laughs> uh, so a couple of things that I've been passionate about is one of them is our officer retirement program. Yes, sir. And um, and so it is, that's one of the ways I'm trying to impact and maybe help out law enforcement agencies across the state. I don't know if it would be a huge impact, but I think it would be a positive one for departments to have some of their retired personnel be able to come back. Of course. And, and, and not have to wait that year. I know if I sat out a year, if I knew I was going to go back, I, I'm done. I'm not going to go back. I'm, I've already started my new career at that point in time. Um, so one of my fights has always been is to try and remove the cap and remove that year and allow these officers to get back to work and bring their knowledge back to the department. And I support that 100%. Thank you, sir. Um, in saying that, so, and I understand you meet the qualifications and you, you're, you're over age, you're coming back from retirement. What's over age mean? What? <laughs> 
you got over the over the required age, so you can come back without having to wait that yes, year. Sir. So, um, and I understand all that. Now, some departments require, okay, if you do come back, you can't come back at the rank you retired right. at. And there are a few that would allow you back then when you were allowed to do it to come back at that rank. Um, and and li listening to all your your knowledge and what you could bring to the department at the same time, bringing new ideas sometimes isn't a bad thing. You, with, with having a new person come in, that's, that's not always a bad thing either. Correct? Correct. Um, I am, uh, one of you, what, how many boards, if I'm remembering right, how many boards are you sitting on right now? I sit on a lot. I can't. I, I don't. I don't know. The okay. I really don't know the number. I've, I've never sat down and just counted them up. But I mean, I serve on a lot of committees and, and boards, uh, from, you know, uh, emergency management with with our Lexington Richmond Five School Board to to many um, some national boards, a director to national intelligence uh, partners board, um, the. Law enforcement, uh, lawful access, emerging technology. I mean, it goes on and on. I mean, okay. I serve okay. on a lot. Perfect. That, that's fine. Um, would Would you say it's always in in the, your best interest as well? If every leader or every uh, chief in the in the, the state, they should be teaching their position to uh, the person below them as well as around them, preparing for the next generation. Absolutely, and that's exactly what I do every day. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you still part of the uh, Law Enforcement Coordinating Committee, LEC? Yes, sir. I am. And that's kind of one of the big things. That's yes, to train and prepare the, those around them. When, uh, Got to uh, meet them more. Yes, sir. Um, um, so Chief Zumalt was one of the biggest pushers right. for you learn your position, the person below you, and the person above you's position because you never know. Right. And I've always believed in that, and we always kind of prepare for that next that next step. Um. So, what what are the other parts? So you're over, are you still on the board of CALIA too? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not on the CALIA board. No. Are you an inspector for CALIA? I am an assessor for CALIA. Okay. I have been since 1994. Okay. Um, so I'm going to probably not to say not to say you did it <laughs> or anything like that, but as an inspector, you would go travel across the country for CALIA. That's correct. Um, I've sat in many of those because. The city of North Charleston where we retired from, right. and I heard you earlier say something about if zero tolerance against lying or, or changing. And as of right now in the state, if an officer comes in and files a report, and they go back and try and change it because it, they altered it to fit what they wanted to do, that's lying. They would be could be, be fired. Yeah. Correct. Could be. So I'll sit in uh, a CALEA accreditation the inspectors are in. We're sitting there. We're going through all the reports and make sure we got everything so we could be reaccredited. And this is always the, the not the accreditation period, the, the reaccreditation period. And lo and behold, I've been sitting in them, and they would say, we need some reports for these, these, and these, and we'd have to backdate them. And that way we'd be meet reaccreditation for national accreditation through CALEA. And um, then I talked to my other friends. Is that is that a common practice? No, sir, not to backdate. CALEA doesn't require you to backdate reports. Um, as an assessor, if I went in and I was looking for a compliance report on the standard that was not there, I would ask where those reports were and if they could furnish me those reports. But if they could furnish those reports, in other words, they had the data, but maybe just had not done the report. For example, an annual report on pursuits right so they have the pursuit reports but they've not done the annual report that basically would compare you know the problems they had whether there was whether there's changes they need to make in their policy as such we certainly would not ask them to backdate a report we would just ask them to provide the report for that time period so say it was 2023 well that report's not in the file we need that report so they would have to go and take those pursuit reports you know, put them together, write a, a, a report that would be a review, basically, of, of what had happened and the number of pursuits and, you know, the outcome of the pursuits and that type of thing, any recommendations they might have on a policy. But a uh, CALEA assessor would never uh, recommend or suggest to anybody to go back and backdate a report. I, well, I'm, I'm not saying you. I'm just saying I've been in those 
they have. Yeah, I they, understand. I've, that, I've been sitting in those, those those things. So my question, and what I'm leading up to is how many, and, and I don't know if you, you you might not know this, I've talked, how many departments in the state right now are state accredited? Do you know? I, I do not know that I think it's, right now. I think it's small. It's like 30 maybe? Yeah, it's probably about 30. Yeah, 30, it's, 35. It's actually, it's actually grown and since y'all passed, uh, I think it was House Bill, the 30, was it 3050 that put the uh, yes, sir. Put the criteria in place for agencies and policies. We've seen more people get involved in state and national process since then, which is a good thing. And that would help all the departments kind of be playing within the same rail if we, if we can get them all accredited. Sure. Especially through the state. Sure. Um, so let me ask you, did you uh, a matter of fact, the other day you and I were speaking about um, – uh, another another area I've been passionate about is PTSD. Do you believe officers can suffer from post traumatic stress disorder? Oh, absolutely, absolutely uh, they can. So, so the other day we were talking about it and a little bit, and we talked about SC Leap, which I think is a great program. I think has helped many. I think we have to do a better job of getting more information out there to our law enforcement agencies and fire departments, letting them know that this this program is out there. Um, we talked a little bit about the retirement. So, uh, actually, this month here, April, will be 12 years on a young lady that, that I had to deal with, and her body was dumped on Jedburg exit. To this day, I go by, and I can still picture her, her laying there. Um, so, let's say I've been now retired for six years, and I start having issues. Does SC Leap come in and, and help me at, that, at this point? Yes, we will. And as I told you the other day, we just offered our first, well, we've done two now for retired officers. Um, it doesn't matter how long they've been out. Some of them been out long. Some of them been out much longer than that. And we offered uh, offered them to come to the post-critical incident seminar. And again, any follow-up that they needed after that, or if they had reached out prior to that, on their own, SC League would have provided us whatever assistance we could provide. When, when did that portion start? Because I remember having a meeting with uh, Chief Stewart and the chairman's office, and at that point in time, the retired wasn't – if they were separated for so long. Well, the retired obviously do not have the insurance policy that the state is right. paying for now, the additional insurance policy. Um, do not have that. But they do have, again, uh, they have the assistance of SC Leap. I mean, and as I said, we just offered two post-critical incident seminars to retired officers, and some of those, because I know some of them, some of them were our, our folks that participated in the in the PCIS, and and they had been retired for a number of years. I got you. How about officers who have had issues with, uh, and it made them quit, or they got fired for whatever because they couldn't come to work anymore? We've, we've had we've had that happen. We've had officers that got injured in the line of duty, could not end up uh, moving on. We've had officers that's been terminated that, that we've assisted and continued to assist as well. Um, again, it's the one thing if you know about Eric Skidmore and his folks is he's not going to turn anybody down. And if an officer needs help, he's going to do everything he can to help them, regardless, like I say, whether they've been terminated, you know, for policy violation or, um, again, whether they've been injured in the line of duty and, and end up not being able to come back to work. Uh, there's going to be a customer SC leap for as long as they as long as long they need help, and we're going to try to find them assistance. And oftentimes, Eric finds them assistance pro bono as well. I mean, we're, right. uh, if, they, if it's, you know, counseling or something that they need. Right. Okay. Um, I got a, a hypothetical real quick. Um, if in, in Allendale, uh, SLED is helping or doing a driver's license checkpoint or a safety checkpoint, and somebody gets charged or what have you, they, they appeal it the whole way to court, and they get a circuit court, and the circuit court deems it unconstitutional to conduct a driver's license checkpoint. Do you operate off of that judge's ruling then, or do you continue doing checkpoints around the state? Well, it would depend on, um, I mean, it, it, again, would depend on the case law. Um, would depend on, you know, did it go, was that a, a circuit court judge ruling? Was that a court of appeals ruling? Was it a Supreme court, court ruling? Um, you know, uh, if it was a ruling that we didn't believe was, was appropriate, we'd probably appeal it. And, well, I understand and, the appeal. And we've, and we've done that. 
Right. No, I understand the appeal, but I'm saying in between the process, the, the judge comes out and rules that I deem it unconstitutional. You can't do any more driver's license checkpoints or safety checkpoints until the appeal process, as of right then, that ruling is considering the, the law at that point, correct? Well, uh I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm a lawyer, but I'm not exactly sure about that. You might get asked. I don't think it is. Quite frankly, I think it, it applies to that case in that court. But I don't know that that would be the ruling like it is in some, like in federal district court, where if a judge makes a ruling, you know, it applies to that entire district. I, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure that's the way it, way it works. But but maybe it does. Okay. You'd have to ask one of those learned lawyers that's uh, sitting up there with you. Uh, well, that question can I'm, answer it better better than me. I'm sure you'll let me know. I try not to let people know I'm a lawyer. <laughs> you, you understand? <laughs> no, I'm sure you'll let me know. Chief, I will tell you, I think you uh, uh, have definitely met all the requirements. I do not think that it looks good. You know, I got officers that would love to come back to work or willing to serve because, like you, they're impacted in a positive way. I was impacted in a positive way many days. You know, through people, I can, I can, I can tell you about hundreds of people who come up and tell me thank you for whatever it was I've done, and it impacts all of us in such a good way. And they would love to come back and share some of that and continue their 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 serving of their city or county or what have you. And I I have a hard time on supporting. Not saying I'm not going to support because I think you've met everything and I think you have uh, acquired what you need to do. And I think you, you continue steering. So I'm not saying I probably would not vote for you, but I'm telling you, I, I have, I don't think it looks very well. And what I think I will probably do is uh, on that day, if you come to the floor for confirmation, I will probably speak at the well for a moment and let everybody understand my position. And then also say, but you have met these requirements. And uh, and you 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 have uh, you would be no different to any other officer within the state if they were to retire and to come back. And um, the only difference I think is in some departments you would lose your rank, in other departments you'd keep your rank. So that, I think that's the only big difference, and that's a that's a individual policy, not the state policy. So I kind of wanted to end on that, but I wanted to be upfront with you and kind of tell you what I might say at the well and kind of what direction I'm going in, because I have officers every day ask me, I would love to come back to work and serve and, uh, and, and, and be able to do that. So, but that's kind of where I was at. I just wanted to be upfront with you, sir. Well, Senator, I appreciate that. I'm, again, you know, I did exactly what uh, the state statutes allow me to do. Yes, sir. Um, and um, I think that uh, when you talk about being an advocate for officers being able to come back to work and, and, and be able to continue with the experience and knowledge and, and training that they have, I think that's exactly what you're looking at as I sit here before you today. And so it, it, it surprised me a little bit, but uh, I understand uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I don't want you to think that uh, that my ideas are old. And that my ideas continue to be old because I'm old. <laughs> um, the bottom line is, uh, I try to, as I told this group yesterday that I talked to in executive management, um, any good leader is going to surround himself with people smarter than he is. And I'm going to tell you the first thing I tell every one of you on that panel I don't pretend to be the smartest guy in the world, but I got enough common sense to surround myself with smart people. And I surround myself with people that have new ideas. And I'm not one that says, you know, um, well, no, we're not going to do it this way because this is the way we always done it. They don't hear that out of my mouth. Because uh, I know we can do things better. I know that as an agency, we have to be progressive in what we do. We have to change with times. And we have to, at the same time, we have to keep a standard that's important to us. And so um, I... Again, I certainly I respect you, respect you, your your opinion, uh, but um, I would uh, I would hate to think that uh, that ultimately in the end that, that that you wouldn't vote for me because of that. But but if that's the case, I I certainly understand that and respect it as well. No, sir, I I don't think that that's the 
I want to make sure you understand. I just want to make sure that the optics, I think, don't look good. And But I do agree with your experience, your knowledge, your background, um, you meeting all the standards. I agree that you're, you're going to be good for the position. I just want to make sure that you understand that, that I know that I want to be a voice for those officers who want to go back to work as well and let them know that just because you're, you're following the same statutes that would be allowed in any department across the state and that that I'm in support of. Okay, so that's that's kind of where I'm at, but I want to speak it well, make sure everybody understands where I'm at, and I'm still fighting to get those officers back into work if they choose to do so. Well, and I, as I told you, I support that as well. Yes, sir. I think that we lose way too many officers who, who, um, they have they have come into this profession when they have not made a whole lot of money. It's an opportunity for them to to better themselves, to give back to their families, and and for them to come back into the profession and to use the knowledge and skill set that they have, and uh, and I support that. And I think that's important that we we do that. And I, you know, I applaud the effort to try to make that happen. You know. Yes, sir. Well, I, on on two two different notes, um, I agree with you. What we did the constitutional carry when that was first done on the on the uh, the Senate, I remember there was a time period in there to allow law enforcement to do some training. Right. But it went over, and then it came back in a conference committee, and that's probably one of the things we didn't catch. And we probably should have caught because I agree we should have given some time in there to allow law enforcement to to prepare for that. Um, in regards to your active shooter training, um, I didn't get to go to y'all's training, but I've been to several different ones, and I've heard nothing but compliments about y'all's active shooter training. Yep. And I think it is uh, it speaks to y'all's professionalism and stuff. And it's first right. class. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So. Um, but I would actually, on a personal note, I would love to come to one of y'all's trainings one day. We'd love to have you. Yes, sir. All you got to do, I'll give you a, a list of scheduled dates when we're doing it, and then any date that you can make it after you get out of General Assembly, I, I assume would be better. Um, and we'd love to have you. Do you use uh, simulation rounds? We do. Good. Yeah. I'd like to be shot with one of those. That's great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. We can make sure that, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, any other questions for Chief Keel? I, I just want I, can I can I end on one thing? I, I want to end on one thing. I, I got my preacher here with me today. He, he goes with me all the time. Well, not that I need him to go with me all the time, but but uh, he does a, a Bible study at our church for law enforcement, and, and there's you know our, our Bible study group has continued to grow, and and uh, I'll tell you that I'll tell. I, Tell everybody this. I wouldn't be where I'm at today um, if it was not for my faith. And because uh, I'm kind of like uh, Senator Hutto said, I come from a little small town. You know, some good people come out of ball. You know, I think about Speaker Block, you know, and, and, and others, and Senator Brown. And, and, uh, and people kind of look at me like I'm somebody important, you know, because I come from Barnum. Um, uh, I'm sure like they do for you, Mr. Chairman, from Edgefield. Um, but every day that I get up, when I got something really important going on, it's like I get some message or some sign or something that that um, that is just so appropriate to what it is I'm doing. And this morning, uh, when I got up, and like I do every morning and sit at my kitchen table and I read my Bible and do my devotion, the first, um, the very first verse that I read this morning when I opened my devotion was Galatians 6, 9. And it says, so do not let us be weary of doing what is right. For we will reap at harvest time if we don't give up. Senator Adams, I'm not giving up. I'm going to continue to do what's right. And that's why 
I want to be in this position. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right, before we um, before we have a motion on your nomination, there are a few people who signed up to speak as well. Um, so first, I have Sheriff Wallace from Marion County. Sheriff, you you want to speak? Sheriff, I feel like um, I don't know I don't know really what you're going to say, so I feel like I need to put you under oath if you're okay with that. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, you swear to tell the truth, Paul truth, nothing but the truth, stuff you got. I do. All right. We'll be happy to hear from you. I had good morning on my notes, but good afternoon. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee, it's an honor to be here today to speak on behalf of Chief Kill. I am Brian Wallace, Sheriff of Marion County and current president of the South Carolina Sheriff's Association. As president of the South Carolina Sheriff's Association, I think I speak for members of our association, and I dare speak for the entire state of South Carolina law enforcement community. When I say there's no one more qualified than Chief Kill, the view uh, Chief Kill's leadership, experience, commitment, and expertise, critical components, our collective ability to deliver professional law enforcement services to the great citizens of South Carolina. Chief Kim Keel, it is him, led his uh, professional law enforcement agency, his integrity, his gold standard by which all law enforcement agencies are measured. He has worked tirelessly to ensure that South Carolina has received the same level of law enforcement excellent to any citizen anywhere else in this great country. We realize that uh, SLED has great resources. They look at criminal trends, and they present new technology to our law enforcement community. Chief Keel himself has been an indispensable resource for investigative assistance from sheriff's offices across this state. As sheriff of Marion County, I could call any federal agency to ask for resources, but my first call is to Chief Keel. His calls are often made on weekends, nights, even when he's on vacation. One thing I can say for Chief Kill, he always answers my call. He leads by example and works tirelessly to ensure that no call for SLED assistance for any agency, small or large, goes unanswered. And when the assistance arrives, it is the highest quality and caliber. As a result of Chief Kill's insight and vision, SLED established one of the finest crime labs in the country. The lab has its incredible analysts that become instrumental in the arrest and convictions of the most violent criminals in South Carolina. Quite simply, there's no other law enforcement need or request that beyond SLED's capability, and I contribute this to Chief Kill. I thank you for your unwavering support for law enforcement officers throughout South Carolina. Like Chief Kill, I know that public safety is a top priority and that you all understand that serving our communities in this uncertain times can be a daunting task. Knowing that we have Chief Kill, Chief of SLED makes our job much easier. We thank him for his leadership, and I thank you for your time and support this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the Sheriff? Sheriff, thank you for driving all the way over here. Appreciate you being here, and I, and I know we made you sit for a few hours, so I appreciate you sticking around well thank you very much for your for your comments they pay me the same either way I thank, you. thank you thank you <laughs> thank you thank you all right um chief holbrook chief you uh you swear you promise your firm that whatever you tell us is gonna be the truth the whole truth nothing but the truth so up you guys yes sir I do. all right now chief keel kind of called you out there at one point he did he took some of my material too. Yeah. okay all right um good afternoon mr chairman members of the committee so it, it, it uh, as the sheriff said it's also my privilege to speak to you in support of um, chief kill's reappointment um as the chief of state law enforcement division i'm gonna um and i'd also like to say that there is a um strong contingent alumni association that is um on the rank and file at the at SLED now. Uh, so some of those stars he talked about uh, 
um, hiring from um, some of the agencies around the state. We've um, we provided a few of those. You've been the victim. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And he's right. We do see a return on that investment. And I'm going to speak a little bit about that. Um, and I, I want to give you a perspective from a, um, a larger agency, um, second largest agency in the state, but a, a, an agency um, in a city that is the capital city and has a very unique responsibility um, being a home state government, um, our flagship university, five, um, five colleges and universities, um, uh, Trauma One Hospital, and just a, a, a growing metropolitan area. But um, I, I would take, uh, I could take you back 10 years. Yesterday was my 10th anniversary with the city. And um, I'm not, I didn't come up through the ranks at the police department here in Columbia. Um, my career was mainly in North Carolina. And um, so I was some, somewhat of an outsider, um, although uh, having uh, a long career in policing in the South. But the very first person that, um, that I met as an incoming police chief was, was Mark Hill. And um, he came to me as a representing the state law enforcement division, but um, as a police professional and a um, resident of Richland County, Columbia. And um, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. He, um, he knew the um, situation I was walking into and he said, this is our state capital. Um, this is my city, and, and and you're at the head of the police department that serves here, and I, I want to do everything that I can um, to make you successful um, and restore um, the reputation and trust in the Columbia Police Department. And he has been a man of his word. A few months um, after I started, um, I scuttled our our forensic lab, um, our drug analysis lab, and and asked SLED to come in and, and, and look at uh, what we had done, had been doing, look at our evidence procedures. Um, in the, in the uh, months that followed, it, um, I scuttled our lab. Um, not only did they provide important input that, that gave direction for us to reestablish that, but they also um, really stepped into that gap that was created and um, um, didn't miss a beat with handling all of our lab requests, all of our uh, um, drug analysis, which was uh, voluminous. Um, they also helped train our chemists and um, quickly helped us reconstitute a lab that is thriving today, uh, has um, two outstanding chemists and um, state-of-the-art equipment. And, um, and, and again, it was um, something that I think was a little bit out of the ordinary, but something he um, immediately stepped into and, and embraced. And I'm going to I'm going to read off just some sentinel moments and and my tenure here that uh, I think speaks to the mission of SLED and being an assistant agency, and also speaking to what Chief Kill means when he says you can call me anytime, um, and we're going to provide service um, and meet your request. So in 2015, as, as many will remember, we experienced a thousand year flood here. And um, it had um, some catastrophic consequences uh, with infrastructure, uh, major facilities and entire neighborhoods. And we had a prolonged period of time where we were um, providing security to, to the infrastructure uh, and um, in these important neighborhoods beyond just patrol. It was, um, you know, places have been completely abandoned that were very vulnerable to uh, um, looting or further damage. And um, SLED um, stepped right into that gap and um, assisted us for an extended period of time. From that period on, uh, really through 2020, um, we began experiencing as a profession uh, um, protests. Um, we were addressing the um, Confederate flag issue at the State House. Um, we had um, some, uh, a number of assemblies and protests that um, um, led to some violence. And then we had a series of, um, of protests that occurred over literally several years um, post Ferguson incident and then leading up to the George Floyd incident. And 
not only did they always assist us and um, with our role um, in policing and assisting BPS here on the state grounds, but oftentimes, as we have all seen, what starts on the state grounds um, ends up in, on the city streets of Columbia, and they have um, always supplemented um, our staffing and been part of our response to make sure that um, we protect the rights of our citizens to protest and assemble, but make sure that it's, it's safe. They especially stepped into the gap when we had two days of riots in 2020, and then we had 60 days of protests following that. Um, every single time, um, every single day, we had sled supplementing um, and working side by side with our officers. We have made dozens of expedited lab requests with respect to DNA. In 2017, um, they provided material investigative support and lab support um, to identify a serial rapist that was operating in the Five Points area of town, um, led to um, an arrest and conviction. In 2019, they were instrumental in um, assisting us with the Samantha Joseph uh, abduction and murder from Five Points. That was an expedited DNA um, examination, and again, it led to um, an arrest and conviction. There was a mention of violent crime by um, Senator Devine, and um, they have been a partner in our efforts to um, combat violent crime. It has been at historic levels here in the city of Columbia. Um, he has been a um, supporter and participant in our ceasefire Columbia since its inception in 2015. We meet twice a year. We um, bring in the most violent offenders um, with the help of Triple P, and they hear from um, leaders of state, local, and federal law enforcement, and they hear a strong message from our SLED chief. And that program um, has an incredible success rate with reducing recidivism, and um, um, it is our, our recidivism rate is about a third of what the national recidivism rate is, and, and I attribute uh, much of that to um, the contributions of Chief Kill and his embracing of that program. In 2019, our agency was awarded a crime gun intelligence grant. We were one of seven in the country to receive that award. One of the reasons I feel like we were competitive and received that award is because Chief Kill agreed to allow us to put an analyst in his lab um, to conduct Niven entries. Um, pretty unheard of, our employee in his lab. Um, that model and our approach to response to gunfire um, through leverage and technology like ShotSpotter has become a model for other sites in the state um, as well as our neighboring states. Uh, we have visitors all the time that want to see um, how our crime gun intelligence unit is set up and what our processes are. Um, their their Niven Center that uh, or their their Niven process that he mentioned in, in the IBIS program um, is one of the top producers in the entire country. Uh, they are always in the top five in the number of entries um, and, the, and the number of, of leads that are produced. Last year, um, that program produced about 2,300 leads for us, um, connecting guns to prolific offenders um, and to incidents that occur. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I submit to you that that is exactly what we need to be doing. We need to be leveraging technology to identify our most prolific offenders that are impacting communities that we serve. And they are uh, leading the way with that. And, um, and a, an agency that's reaped in tradition and processes and procedures, um, I felt um, that it was substantial that um, they deviated uh, slightly to allow us to put this employee in their lab. I thought it was innovative, and it, it, it showed me that he's uh, willing to listen and um, be a part of um, being part of a solution. It's, it's, it's a, a model of success. Um, I know firsthand is I, I, I just finished um, 
my presidency with the state um, law enforcement officers association, and um, I get to be around in in that capacity. I was around uh, police chiefs all across the state, um, and overwhelmingly, um, what we hear is how much support we get from state law enforcement division, and the, that starts at the top. Um, I agree with with Chief Keel. His um, his team that he surrounds himself with is second to none, um, and they are second to none because that starts um, with the way he leads the agency and the in the um, expectations he sets for his, his agents and his executive staff. And uh, I would I would like to finish by just um, mentioning what he briefly covered with um, the introduction of their aviation unit to crime suppression work throughout the state but in particular here in, in Columbia. Um, they, on a weekly basis, they assist us with um, violent crime suppression. And just as they have leveraged technology, uh, we have done the same. We have a real-time crime center. Um, our connectivity uh, to um, SLED aircraft is um, give the SLED pilots real-time instantaneous um, information when we have a shot spotter alert gives them coordinates. Um, they can see the alert um, on their screens and they are on you know, on site immediately. Um, it has led to apprehensions of prolific offenders, recovery of firearms, um, but I would also submit to you that um, it puts them on situations that often result in pursuits. And it allows us to um, handle pursuits in a much more prudent and cautious manner. And again, I think that um, ultimately saves lives. And um, you just have to look to earlier this week, uh, we know the, the dangers and pursuits and, and the unintentional things that can happen with that. And uh, that aviation asset is, is a, a very powerful and needed tool throughout our state. And they don't hesitate to uh, provide that to law enforcement. And finally, I would um, be remiss if I didn't mention how, how important and how much impact it has had with how Chief Kill has leaned into police reform. Um, you know, South Carolina, I think, has made some um, incredibly courageous um, um, or passed some incredibly courageous pieces of legislation that have really set us apart from uh, many other states. And uh, we lead the way in police reform and policing ourselves and making sure we get rid of uh, problem police officers. Um, it raises um, it raises the standard for our profession, and it's what our citizens expect. Um, I think his leadership on the uh, training council um, helps guide helps guide that. And um, I'm very proud of the work that um, we have done. I'm proud of our, my fellow chiefs and how they have also leaned into this. And um, um, I feel like our law enforcement uh, profession in this state is on. Um, incredibly solid ground and I think we do a fantastic job in, um, in policing ourselves and holding ourselves to um, a higher standard. Um, I love this man. I can um, I consider him a friend, a colleague, uh, a mentor, and um, I can think of no better person to lead the state law enforcement division in Mark Hill. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Any questions for Chief Holbrook? Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Chairman, can I can I just say con congratulations on your ten years, and and I am so proud of you. <laughs> um, Chief Stewart. All right, Chief, you're, you're last on the list. Don't screw this up. Don't worry. I'm going to uh, be very brief. Uh, all right. All right. You, you swear you'll tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Happy to hear from you. Thank you. I've known Mark Keel for over 40 years as SLED chief. It was my honor to promote him through the ranks at SLED, uh, captain, major. He was my chief of staff. He's totally competent experience in all aspects of SLED and law enforcement from investigative, complex investigative matters to tactical, to he even flies helicopters out there. Um, 
he's excelled in each position he's held in, in all regards. He's, he's a competent professional uh, in, in, in all aspects of what he does. I, I, you know, I've been retired for 17 years. I still watch closely what goes on, and I can assure you he, he is outstanding uh, in all regards. He's a true servant leader. He takes care of his people. He takes care of the people of South Carolina. Um, we've been together in many, many difficult and dangerous situations side by side. He doesn't bend. He doesn't break. He's straight down the line. Uh, he's a good, honest, brave, religious man. And that's what we need in, in state government and in all levels of government, especially in law enforcement. Uh, he cares deeply for the members of SLED, for the law enforcement community, and for the safety of the people of South Carolina. I appreciate Governor McMaster reappointing him to this position, and I respectfully request the Senate to confirm his appointment as SLED chief once again. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any questions for Chief Stewart? No. All right. All right, now, Mrs. Keel, I'm going to ask you again. I mean, you've been listening to all this stuff. Are you sure you want us to do this? You sure? All right. All right, is the, um, is there a motion on Chief Keel's nomination? Second. Right, sir, second. All right. Any opposition to sending Chief Keel's nomination on to the full committee? Hearing none, then we will do that in a unanimous manner, send that on to the full committee. And, Chief, um, I, uh, I don't know, Senator Adams said – he feels like he might have made the dumb move by getting involved in politics. I think you're involved in more politics than, than some of us are, but so you know how things operate around here. It may take us a few weeks to get to it, but we'll we'll get to it at some point on the floor before. And with you, it's especially timely because you're in an interim position now, so we have to deal with you before before we adjourn, um, or else there'll be some real trouble over there. Uh, so, and we, we appreciate that. But um, thank you for being here. Thank you, Miss Skill, for being here as well. Pastor, thank you for being here. And everybody else who's been been here um, this morning and into this.